Good evening, everybody. I'm really happy to be here and see what a great turnout we have. And all this interest in Fire Island and our uh, sunken forest. So um, the sunken forest is a, an amazing place to visit, whether it's uh, summer or winter. It, you can actually get there at this time of year. It might be a little challenging. Um, but we're going to take, uh, I'm a, first of all, I'm a park ranger at Fire Island. I'm in my ninth year working with the National Seashore. Um, my background is biology and oceanography. And um, so Fire Island National Seashore has been in existence for uh, somewhere just shy of 60 years. And the sunken forest was actually one of the keystones in the creation of the National Seashore. And its donation uh, to the National Park Service was, was key. And um, so it's a globally rare maritime holly forest. A globally rare means there are two in the world. So our sunken forest is one. The second one is in Sandy Hook, New Jersey. So very similar barrier beach kind of uh, setting um, near the ocean, uh, salt air, salt water. And um, so just a little overview of Fire Island to start with. So let me see if I can get my slides going. Okay, so this map shows where Fire Island National Seashore is uh, in the sort of big picture of Long Island. It's 32 miles long um, and it runs from the Mauritius Inlet down to the Fire Island Inlet. And our area of jurisdiction is really from uh, Smith Point where the bridge is uh, from Mastic Beach down to the Fire Island Lighthouse. So the very western tip of Fire Island is actually Robert Moses State Park. Um, we also include the, um, the William Floyd Estate in Mastic Beach. That's also one of our, um, our sites. It's closed for the season now, but it's a very interesting historic home. And um, Fire Island is one of 10 national seashores. So right now, I think we're up to 423 national park units. This will include historic sites, uh, battlefields, national seashores, the big western parks. So um, a lot of people don't realize that um, for the Statue of Liberty, for example, is one of the national park units, as well as Fire Island National Seashore. So um, it was, Fire Island National Seashore was established in 1964. And one of the big things was to preserve the sunken forest. And Robert Moses, who we all know that name, if you've lived on Long Island for any length of time, um, he was building parkways and bridges, and he had this great plan to build a, um, a parkway right down Fire Island, all the way from um, Robert Moses State Park through to the Hamptons. And so community, um, community, residents on Fire Island got behind um, Congressman Otis Pike from Riverhead and introduced the bill in 63, which was passed in 1964. So let's look at another map with a little more detail. I know it might be tiny on your screen, so um, I, I ask for your forgiveness ahead of time, uh, but if you sort of squint and look real, real, real close, you can see at the right side of the screen is um, the bridge at Smith Point. So that's sort of our Eastern boundary, our Fire Island Wilderness Visitor Center. And then if you go all the way to the West End, you can see sort of on the very edge of the map, the Robert Moses Causeway and the Fire Island Lighthouse, which is right at the border of the Robert Moses State Park and Fire Island National Seashore. Uh, in between, there's a lot of little icons for Sailor's Haven, um, which is opposite Sayville, and Watch Hill, which is opposite Patchog. And um, what's kind of unique, one of the unique things about Fire Island is that we have 17 
private communities embedded within the national park. So all those sort of white areas are uh, private communities uh, serviced by ferries. There's no vehicles on Fire Island, except for some emergency vehicles. And some of the residents are allowed to drive there in the winter. So if you wanted to come to the Sunken Forest, you'd have to start in Sayville. And um, you'll probably arrive by ferry. So the Sayville Ferry runs a seasonal service um, to Sailor's Haven. That's the name of the little marina that we have there. Um, in the pictures, you can see here, there's the ferry coming in. It's a, it's a small, relatively small marina. And that's our visitor center, um, sort of behind the flag. And that's kind of a snack bar over on um, that, the building you see there in that second picture. So there's a, there are a limited number of ferries to Cherry Grove and the Fire Island Pines, which is a, uh, Cherry Grove is just a, um, under a mile. Um, Fire Island Pines is maybe two miles. So it's not, it's not um, unreachable uh, in the winter months. In the summer, we do have rangers on hand uh, in, the, in season. So probably uh, May through October, we have uh, rangers on hand to answer questions and we do have tours. So I hope this presentation will inspire you to jump on the ferry and, and come and see us in person because it's really pretty fabulous. So um, here's, here's what one of our boardwalks looks like. And um, uh, as you probably understand, I'm not really in the forest while I'm speaking. I'm in my dining room like you guys are. Um, but this is a uh, this is what it looks like. And um, it's not really sunken below sea level, but but it, it's special in that it's beh it's sunken behind the dunes, let's say. So uh, here's a cross section of Fire Island from ocean to bay. And where the island is wide enough, so if you think back to that map, it's a long, skinny island, less than a quarter mile wide in most places. So here would be a little wider section. And we start with the beach over there. The ocean beach would be on the left of this uh, diagram. And it's wide enough to have a secondary dune here. So the primary dune is that one that gets blown away by the wind and the waves can beat against it. And it's a, it's a younger dune. Um, it's in, in time terms, it's maybe hundreds of years old, that, that primary dune, because it does get washed away by the ocean. We, we lost a lot of dunes um, during Hurricane Sandy nine years ago. And then the secondary dune is an older dune. It's much more protected. Uh, in between is a swale area. We'll talk about all these a little more. Uh, but the forest would be behind the secondary dune. So it's it's really protected. Um, the sea breezes from the ocean carry nutrients. So the sea breezes aren't a bad thing. But the plants, the new growth on the plants don't like that salt spray. So the salt spray actually does a great job of of pruning the, the tops of the trees so that we get this um, sunken appearance. So here's the secondary dune. If you can make out in what most of these people are looking toward this little rise of land, that would be the secondary dune. It's not big. And here are some of the trees. And they. Um, what you'll notice first of all is that we get these twisted um, branches that have a lot of not just vertical growth. They're not just growing up towards the sun. They're competing with each other and they're close together. So you get a lot of horizontal growth and you get this almost bonsai looking uh, look to the trunks of the trees. And because um, and th they're all competing for light. They're all competing for light there. Salt spray pruning here is a super example. When you come to visit the forest, this is a great photo op because the, the trees uh, cover the trail. They reach right over the trail, but they look like they've been pruned by someone mechanically, but it's not, it's salt spray pruning. Uh, 
Um, here's the boardwalk, and these are some of the trees we'll see. And um, holly or ho holly trees are the primary trees we'll find in the forest. And um, to the right of the boardwalk, you can see that grayish green bark. And uh, hollies are pretty uh, well recognized. Some of the other trees we have, I'll, I'll look at them a little more closely um, to see what we what we'll find here. So American holly is uh, this typical holiday decoration with the red berries. Interestingly, you'll find some trees with berries and some without because there are male and female holly trees. And you may have noticed this in your own garden if you have a holly tree. It either has berries or it doesn't. And so uh, holly berries are not edible to humans, but the birds do eat them. And the trunk is sort of this smooth grayish green bark. And if you notice the uh, tree in the top left of the slide, they have these features that look like they're ovals. They're long horizontal ovals that look like eyes. And these are limb scars. So this is, this is really interesting. The trees are able to um, self prune or cut off circulation to the branches that aren't getting sunlight. So in, in order to put all the energy up toward the top of the tree, where the leaves are all competing to get into the sunlight, it'll actually drop its own lower limbs. And we get these, uh, the pattern on the, the trunk of the tree looks like eyes. And you can see how the trees do look bare. The lower limbs, the lower part of the trunk looks bare. Um, and we're going to come to what we would call the heart of the forest. We have this wonderful deck. Um, it's where we do a lot of ranger talks. People stop and take a break there. And these are the oldest trees in the forest. So they're not old as the sequoias. They're not growing six feet across. These are maybe 14 to 18 inch diameter trunks but these are the oldest trees in the forest. It's a mature forest and they're between 250 and 350 years old. So these are our holly trees. Here's another typical tree that we have in the maritime holly forest. And sassafras is easy to recognize because the leaves come in different shapes, as you can see from the picture. So we see a leaf on the left that's sort of like an ordinary leaf, and then there are mitten shapes and sort of dinosaur footprint shaped leaves. And this is typical of a sassafras tree, it makes them really easy to identify. Um, sassafras roots were the source of the original sarsaparilla or root beer. And it's made from artificial ingredients nowadays, but the leaves are sometimes dried for tea or uh, in Cajun cooking, it's, there's an ingredient called filet that's used to thicken um, gumbo. And that's from a sassafras leaf. That's kind of interesting. So another tree, and this is like the third, we have this trifecta of the, the most common trees so after holly and sassafras, we see serviceberry. Um, it's got a couple of different names, uh, shadbush or shadblow, because the berries, um, or sorry, the, it tends to bloom when the shad or the river herring are running. Juneberry, because the berries do ripen in June, and serviceberry, because it tended to bloom at the first thaw when funeral services could be held because the ground was soft enough to dig graves. But um, these are edible berries. Uh, humans can eat them. They're very tasty and sort of a well-kept secret of Fire Island because if you find them and make a pie, it's outstanding. Um, some of the trees in the forest will be marked by these holes. And if we look more closely, we'll see that it's not the really thin bark of a, a holly, and it's not that thicker bark of a sassafras. It's the just right medium bark of this Juneberry tree. 
And these holes are made by a woodpecker known as a yellow-bellied sapsucker. And um, they'll actually drill these holes. They will come back and eat the insects that are trapped in the sap, as well as uh, consuming the sap itself. So they're very clever birds. Um, here's a picture of one. It's not the greatest photo, but you can see the trees, the, sorry, the holes that it's drilled in this tree. And I have to confess that this was a maple tree in my front yard here in Long Island uh, that I saw this bird. But this is the yellow-bellied sapsucker that uh, makes the, the mysterious holes in the Juneberry trees. The understory. We have a lot of plants. So imagine we are taking this walk through the forest and um, looking up at the trees and then looking at some of the plants that might live in the understory. So uh, the one on the left is a cat briar. These are not uncommon here on Long Island. Um, cat briar because the, the thorns will scratch you like a cat scratch. They have very long, very sharp thorns. And this and other vines are what sort of add to the mystique of the sunken forest. That, the vines climb to the top of the trees. Some other vines we have are Virginia creeper and um, wild grapes, and they all sort of dangle from the trees on these sort of bare trunks underneath the canopy. The center picture I have here is a um, black cherry tree. So black cherry is very common. It is there's a lot of shrubs and smaller um, black cherry trees, saplings in the understory because the deer don't like them. Just like other um, trees or plants in this family with black cherry, we have almonds and apples as well, but they have uh, a compound uh, of cyanide in the leaves that, that make them um, not very tasty, not attractive to deer. Just like if you've ever bitten into an apple seed, that sort of bitter taste, that's, that's what these leaves would taste like. And they do have cherries. Uh, black cherry trees have edible cherries, but the stone or the pit in the middle is about as big as the cherry. So they're not really nice to eat, uh, but the birds like them. On the right is one of our very, very common uh, plants. You probably recognize poison ivy. This is actually flowering poison ivy in this picture. So we get to see it at all of its stages. And the, um, the poison ivy, if, if you're familiar, you know, it can grow along the ground. It can climb up a tree like a vine and it also grows into shrubs. So it's pretty much everywhere. Uh, the berries are eaten by birds. Um, Humans seem to be the only uh, creatures that are affected by the oils that cause that itchy rash. And poison ivy and the abundance of poison ivy um, is one of the reasons we suggest that people stay on our boardwalks because it's, it's really everywhere. And one of the suggested uh, reasons for naming Fire Island, Fire Island was that the flaming red color that all this poison ivy turns in the fall. Um, someone thought it, it might look like the island was ablaze. So uh, poison ivy is with us and it's everywhere. Um, we have freshwater bogs and this is kind of interesting. There are, they're not streams on Fire Island, but there are ponds and bogs. So as the tides change, um, the salt water rises and the fresh water floats on top. So we see tidal action in these bogs and they can be identified uh, best by the um, vegetation that grows there. So this is kind of a winter picture and it's tough to see what's growing there. But if I do a close up, um, there's a couple of other plants here. So the one on the left, is a cattail and cattails only grow in fresh water. So if we see cattails growing also ferns, uh, we know that that's a, a spot with just fresh water. Um, 
the plant in the right hand picture is Phragmites. And Phragmites is a very, very strong competitor to the cattails because it can grow in fresh water and in brackish water. So we see Phragmites uh, here on Long Island, a lot of um, disturbed ground, anywhere there's water, whether it's fresh water or uh, brackish water, uh, we'll see Phragmites growing. And we see them in the sunken forest side by side. But the way we identify our little freshwater bogs is the fact that uh, cattails don't grow in the brackish water. So if we're walking quietly along the trail, these are some of the common animals we might see uh, in the sunken forest. We have two varieties of snakes. Um, they're both harmless, not venomous. That's a common garter snake on the left, on the upper left. Um, and that's a black racer on the top right. So uh, they're very common. We, they're shy, so we don't see them that often. But if you're the first person to walk along the boardwalk uh, in the morning, you might just see a snake. Um, more often, we hear a sort of rustling in the underbrush and uh, might be a box turtle. So box turtles are fairly common. They are very well camouflaged and they live on the forest floor. Um, their lifetime is spent in a radius of a couple of hundred yards. They don't go very far um, and they're well protected by their shells and, and by their camouflage. And then the last picture there is a white-tailed deer. So there's a buck sleeping under the trees. Uh, they're also fairly common. Um, we'll talk more about them a little bit later when we talk about uh, issues that are being faced by the forest today. So birds, um, there's a lot of birds. It's a forest. Um, if we have any real serious birders out there, you'll probably easily recognize the two birds on the screen now. So the Eastern Toey is the top one. Uh, they're very common. They're in the underbrush. We hear them uh, rustling around. They're, they, they're insect eaters. And um, we, we're see, we see them mostly on the forest floor. And the cat bird, the, the gray bird in the lower picture, is common here on Long Island as well. They are uh, fairly closely related to mockingbirds, so they do mimic other bird sounds. And uh, they get their name because one of their calls sounds a lot like a bird, uh, sorry, like a cat, like rah! So um, these are two of our most common birds. We also have a wide variety of warblers in season. So this is a yellow warbler. Um, they actually breed right in the forest. So we see them all year round um, on the shoulder seasons. So spring and fall, we see loads of other warblers that are passing through. Fire Island is in the um, Eastern Flyway. So a lot of migratory birds pass through. They stop to eat the, the plentiful berries and, uh, and move on. But the yellow warbler we see um, most of the summer in the forest. So as we're walking through the forest, well, before we leave the forest, do we have any questions? <laughs> as we walk into the swale, any, we'll have time for, for question and answer at the end too. Just wanted to pause for see if anybody had any questions so far. Okay, so here's, again, you can clearly see how people might have named it the sunken forest because that boardwalk is going where? It, it'll go down the other side of that dune underneath the canopy. So the swale area is this area that's between the primary and the secondary dune. So here's another uh, view of the swale. There is a cement uh, walkway through the swale at this point. Um, you can see the ranger and the kids all looking for birds, but 
the vegetation is quite different. Oh, I see a couple questions. Hang on before I go on. Which holly tree is male? Okay, holly trees. That's a really good question. So it's the female that has the berries. And in the spring, they both have flowers. So that's pretty interesting. And if you look really closely, if you think of a compound flower where you'd see the female part in the middle and the male parts around it, you'll see them separate. So you'll see two different flowers, one sort of like the middle part of an ordinary flower and the other one like the outside part. And they're tiny. They are really little flowers. Can you uh, collect the fruit? Um, yes, okay. Yes, you can. So um, Fire Island National Seashore, like many national parks, has limits on um, how many fruits you can collect. But um, okay, I wouldn't say people collect holly berries because they're not edible. But the June berries, uh, people can collect up to two quarts per person per day. So if you want to make some jam, you can absolutely pick enough to do that. And there's some other berries that are um, that we're going to talk about. Some of the other vegetation things that we can collect and take home and eat, or make jam from. So um, the the vegetation in the swale is very close to the ground. It's uh, it grows that way to conserve moisture and protect against the heat. So um, between the primary and secondary dune, we get a lot of reflection. The, the heat reflects, it's almost like a bowl. So some of these plants, let me move over there. Uh, here are some of the plants that we see in the swale. So on the left with the yellow flowers is beech heather. So beech heather, is, um, you don't really see individual leaves on it. They're right against the stem and they're covered with white hair to reflect the sun. But if you were to go there in um, April or May, you'd see the yellow flowers. That's when they're in bloom. This time of year, everything's sort of gray. Uh, on the upper right, this is a bayberry plant. So bayberry is also a shrub low to the ground. Um, if you've heard of bayberry candles, they are moxy, um, they're white, and you can collect these as well. I tried once as a child to make a candle, and you'd need a lot more berries than you can collect in a day. And what's interesting about the bayberries, think about wax, is a very concentrated fat. So this is a lot of energy for a bird. And the swallows that we see all summer long eating insects, flying around, uh, swooping around, eating mosquitoes. In the fall, they settle down on the bayberry bushes and eat bayberries before their migration to, um, to sort of stock up on all this energy, fatten up. And the picture in the lower right is one of those berries you can collect. It's a beach plum. And beach plums are a little bit tart they grow in sandy soil. Uh, we have some in some coastal areas uh, on Long Island. Fire Island is the place to find them though. And um, they're, some, they're the size of a cherry. The pit inside is the size of a cherry, but they're tart. So they're best eaten as jam. So here are some of our uh, fauna. Um, here's the deer again. They will be in the swale, um, though they, they usually stay more out of sight in the forest. We have a uh, red fox and they will burrow under shrubs right there in the swale. Um, we would see the box turtles and snakes here as well. And um, there's a toad on Fire Island called a fowler's toad. And it's a sort of grayish green, biggish toad and we find them in the swale. After it rains, they come out. So if you are visiting um, Sailor's Haven in the Sunken Forest, I might expect you to walk to the ocean beach. And it's a it's just like all the Fire Island beaches, um, wide sandy beach, um, lots of seashells. There's our boardwalk in the picture. Um, 
Uh, lots of people come and swim. We have lifeguards in the summer and picnic on the beach. We do allow eating on the beach. Um, so the next thing I want to show you is a short video. And we're going to, it talks about some of the challenges um, that are faced by the sunken forest today. So I'm hoping we can hear it. We tested it before. Hi, I'm Jessica Hester, staff writer at Atlas of Is Can everybody hear it? Can I see some thumbs up from the people I see? Okay, perfect. All right, great. And I am wearing this suit because we are trekking into this amazing tick infested sunken forest in Fire Island to see how this unusual ecosystem is changing. The sunken forest is one of only two old growth maritime American holly forests in the world. It's a gnarled, dappled patch of woods on the long, skinny barrier island just 60 miles from New York City. The forest is incredible and it's disappearing, but not for the reasons you might think. If you pick up the sassafras leaves and you crush it up like this and smell it, it smells like Fruit Loops. It really does. <laughs> this is Jordan Raphael, the park biologist. He's worked with the National Park Service at Fire Island for around 15 years and probably knows the sunken forest better than anyone. We met up at his office across the bay, packed up historic maps and old photos, and headed off. But the island is only accessible by boat. I like absolutely everything about this boat. When I fantasized about being a park ranger as a kid, this is like exactly the kind of thing that I dreamed that they would do. <laughs> Just be able to zip around in cool boats. It's a big. On the ride over, Jordan explained that the sunken forest isn't literally sunken, though it kind of looks that way. The trees, American holly, sassafras, black gum, shad blow, grow behind two rows of sand dunes cradled between the ocean and the bay. Looking out from the elevated boardwalk, it's easy to see how the forest got its name. The dunes almost completely obscure the view of the forest from the ocean. The canopies are pruned by salt air blowing in from the Atlantic so the leaves don't peek out above the sand. And following the path deeper into the forest, you really do feel like you're sinking and secluded. Dispatch Seashore 410. Arrived at Sailor's Haven. Before we wandered into the woods, we stopped at the visitor center so Jordan could show me archival photos of what the forest looked like decades ago. They were handed down by Hank Art, an environmental scientist who studied the forest beginning in the 60s. By using the pictures as comparison tools, Jordan estimates that about 40% of the sunken forest has already disappeared over the last few decades. We'll go in, we can pull some of these pictures out to see what it looked like then and what it looks like now. My boss that started here in the mid 90s said when you stood here, you couldn't hardly even see the water. Wow. And that was in the mid 90s. Because there were so many trees? Because there were so many trees here. This is another area where the boardwalk had to be re diverted because of erosion here. So this used to be a, a lookout. Erosion, worsened by docks and marinas, has really reshaped the edges of the forest. Jordan pointed out its old silhouette on an aerial image that the Army Corps of Engineers took back in the 30s. As forest boundaries are washed away, the land is pinched. It keeps getting narrower and narrower. Climate change is a main culprit too, but in some surprising ways. When you think of rising water, maybe you picture waves drowning a shoreline. But in the sunken forest, sea level rise is doing something else. Oh, wow, there's so much water down there. Yeah, so you can see that when we're talking about the water table impacting the trees, it's really close to the surface. Yeah. These have always been here, but uh, they don't quite drain like they used to. Mm. We'll have water that will be standing here after a rain for quite some time. And even when it doesn't rain, they'll be standing water in here. And that's from the water table, again, just getting pushed up. Seawater isn't breaching the dunes and sloshing into the woods. Instead, as the land erodes, the whole water table is rising. There have always been slow draining patches in the woods, but now there's a lot of standing fresh water in places where there wasn't before. And those swampy pools are causing the trees around them to rot and die. So a lot of these ticks carry different pathogens that could make you sick, one being Lyme disease. So we don't want any of our staff, and especially you, getting Lyme disease. 
Shrinking land and rising water are big problems for the forest, but there's another menace that's also causing a lot of trouble. To get a closer look, we had to venture off the boardwalk. The threat is eating the forest to death. And it's pretty cute. It's the deer. Fire Island is full of them. And unfortunately for the sunken forest, they've got an appetite for American holly. Some parts of the forest have been fenced off, so deer can't get to them. It's easy to compare those areas to the rest of the woods, where there's an obvious graze line. It's at the deer's mouth level, and below it, the animals have picked almost everything clean. This is a good example of new growth of a holly that a deer has not been able to get to. Mm. So it does have a natural defense once it's able to get established, because mm. it's holly and it's scal these thorns. Mm -hmm. um, but when it pops out new growth, again, it's impacted by anything that's in the browse line, uh, the deer will nip it off right away. So is that why these lower branches are empty? Yep. You can see, see all the browsing here? Look, Look at all that browsing. See, each part is nipped off. There's, there's some new growth here that hasn't been eaten. Ugh. Yeah. But pretty much all of it. Boom, 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 anything. The deer eat the soft new leaves, which means that young plants get gobbled up and there's not much fresh growth in the forest. Plants are being nibbled faster than there are new ones to take their place. In the areas where the deer are banished, though, the forest is thicker. It's lush, it's green, it's full of new growth. The forest won't be around forever. Jordan says it's hard to say how long it has. Maybe 25 years, maybe 50, maybe 100, maybe more. Though the island is taking some steps to curb the deer population, they haven't found a way to shore up the bay against erosion or to stop the water table from rising. It's just a matter of time. Climate change will drive people from their homes, reshape cities, and cause blooms of disease. Many of those impacts will be huge and massively visible. But the sunken forest is a reminder that some destruction will be subtle, chipping away at beautiful, unsung places before many people even know that they're there to begin with. Today, you can't see the forest from the beach. Eventually, no matter where you stand, there won't be much forest left to see at all. Thanks so much for watching. Subscribe to our channel to check out more awesome videos and hop into the comments to tell us where we should go next. Hi, I'm Jessica. Oh, okay. So. We have plenty of time for questions. That was a, um, the video sort of summed up some of the issues that are facing the forest. So it's sea level rise, which is, is uh, drowning some of the trees and the deer, which are eating all the new holly growth. So um, it, there are challenges. Um, we don't have solutions for everything, um, but we hope you can visit. So any, um, any questions for me? If anyone has any questions, uh, please feel free to, use, uh, to raise hand feature and go on mute here, or if you'd like to type it in the chat. You can write questions into the chat or I guess, Raise your hand and uh, Steve will unmute you. I'd love to see a show of hands. How many of you have actually visited the uh, sunken forest? So we have some. Okay, excellent. Very good. So we have a question. Um, uh, how, are the, how are they killing the deer? Okay. Um, this is very controversial, um, but I, I will uh, give you an overview. You can go onto our website to find out details of this, but they do hire sharpshooters and they actually remove some of the deer by shooting them. Uh, all the meat goes to Island Harvest. This is the third year they've done it. Um, they haven't killed that many deer. The um, an ideal population would be about 25 deer per square mile. And we have almost 250 deer per square mile. So there's a lot of deer on Fire Island. Um, 
So is there an entrance fee? No, there's no fee, except you do have to pay for the ferry and parking in Sayville. But um, we have 100% free ranger tours every single day in the summer. The best time to visit without lots of people would be a weekday um, in the spring or the fall. I would highly recommend the spring because by July the mosquitoes come and there are a lot of mosquitoes in the forest at that time. And you know, we, we recommend you spray up when you go in. Um, We have uh, uh, donations or volunteer efforts available to preserve or protect the forest. Um, you can donate to any national park. It wouldn't go in particular to preserve the forest, but we do accept volunteers. We have volunteers who do a lot of things, do assist with the, assist our resource management biologists who just pick up trash and, and give tours through the forest. So a lot of volunteer opportunities. Um, the branches, I see a question from Cheryl about um, the branches. Absolutely, we do not collect them. So they, where they fall is where they stay uh, because the dead trees are pretty important for um, um, the, uh, some of the animals to live in. Okay, deer overpopulation. Yeah, it's it's still it's still controversial. It's still people will debate it, uh, but yes, this this forest is one of the reasons the park was established, and part of our job is to protect it. Um, how safe from ticks are you? Okay, two questions. First, biting flies. Yes, we have biting flies. If you have biting flies in East Hampton, we probably have biting flies on Fire Island. Depends on how the wind is blowing. Um, the walkway keeps you pretty safe from ticks. You saw what our staff does. We put on Tyvek suits and boots and, and wrap duct tape, tape around the top of our boots when we go in the forest. Um, I actually, I, when I'm working in the summer, I treat my clothes with a chemical called permethrin. You can spray it on your clothing. It's not meant for skin. And if I spray it on my sort of pant legs and socks and boots, I'm pretty well protected if I stay on the boardwalk. Um, hours of operation. Um, we, the rangers come on the ferry. So we're there from when the first ferry arrives to when the last ferry leaves. Uh, but our website, um, I think my last slide had the website. If you just Google Fire Island National Seashore, and um, hours of operation, you can find the visitor center hours pretty easily. And yeah, the deer do carry the ticks around. Yep. Um, the deer are sort of the food source for the ticks. The deer don't actually carry the Lyme disease bacteria. Um, the bacteria reproduce inside mice. So there's a sort of a three-way uh, life cycle. So the deer are the food source for the deer ticks or the black-legged ticks that carry Lyme disease. Um, the bacteria replicate inside the mice and then they pass it on to the humans. Bob, do you have a question? You can unmute. Yeah, Bob, did you have a question? Yeah, I did. Um, so <clears throat> I live on the North Shore of... Uh, Long Island. We have a lot of deer as well in our yard. I use a product called Liquid Fence. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you've heard of it. It's made of uh, urine of a couple of different animals right. and it stinks. It really smells bad. Apparently the deer do not like smell uh, of any kind, whether it's perfume or whether it's mm -hmm. stinky stuff. Um, have you ever thought of using that or is that just too expensive to use i think it would be expensive how often do you have to spray it on it's uh once a month uh, after the first couple of applications and uh that's you know you, you, yeah so you have a pretty large area that you're going to spray it on yeah uh, i, I mean we're looking acres. at over 600 acres 
Yeah, okay. So that's so that's, it's that's, yeah, that's it's challenging. Yeah. But it works. <laughs> okay, good to know. Good to know. Because I, I live on the south shore of Long Island and we have a lot of deer here too. Yeah, they're everywhere right now. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Does anybody else have any um, questions that uh, they'd like to ask Ranger Pat? If you'd like, you can raise your hand and go on mute. Well, um, I'd like to thank you uh, very much for this informative presentation. Um, it is was absolutely fantastic, and we will definitely uh, have to take a trip there uh, to the sunken forest. Um, so just a little question about the ferry. So it, it's the, the Sayville Ferry? Yes, it's the Sayville ferry to Sailor's Haven and they usually start May um, but as I said you can either take the the same from the same spot in Sayville the ferries to the Fire Island Pines and Cherry Grove are are not a long walk it's it's pretty close to get there uh, if the you know if there are no ferries but the Rangers won't be on hand until the ferries are running to Sailor's Haven Fantastic. Lorena, you have a question? You can ask your question. No, I just wanted to thank you um, for this. I used to go there with my family when we were a kid, so it's really nice to see, um, just to go visit again, to kind of visit. Even though it's virtual, we'll just have to take a trip over there. So thank you very much. Oh, you're welcome. And I hope to see everybody there this summer. <laughs> Thank you very much, uh, Ranger Pat, and thank you everybody for zooming in this evening. And uh, we hope you have a wonderful evening and a great rest of the week and a wonderful weekend. And we'll see you again at the next uh, East Hampton Library slash uh, Park uh, Ranger uh, discussion. <laughs> thank you very much. Thank, thank you, you so much. Thank you much, Stephen, uh, for arranging. Thank thanks you, for coming. Thanks, Ranger Pat. <laughs> Bye-bye now.